The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right. Hello, people. Welcome back to the second week of our course. Uh, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to have this wonderful live audience, but I also would like very briefly to address our video audience, who will no doubt be watching this long after I'm dead on MIT's open courseware. Uh, so think of this as a voice from the grave. Uh, you, will so, you will sometimes notice, you in the video audience will sometimes notice that as I'm lecturing to this lively group, I will turn this way and look up. You should realize that what I'm turning at, turning toward and looking up at is this, project, this projection screen, which we will show you. Uh, and it sometimes has this outline on it, which guides us through the, uh, hopefully guides us through each lecture, and sometimes has other information and, and material on it. Uh, sometimes it isn't worth shifting over to show the video audience that image, but that's what I'm looking at when I look so strange. I'd like to begin today by taking a step back, by uh, reminding you that the order in which we're watching the movies in this course is a little bit arbitrary because I wanted to use the feature films as the defining, uh, as the defining date. And that's the reason that we made Keaton come first, because The General is an earlier film. It, it was uh, uh, almost a decade earlier than uh, modern times. But the truth is Chaplin entered film before Keaton. and. Uh, Keaton had certain advantages when, uh, by the time he entered the movies, in part because of Chaplin's example, although also because of the fairly complicated way in which silent film had already elaborated itself after the first 10 years or so of the 20th century. So I want to take a step back into that, into that early phase, just before Chaplin uh, uh, becomes a filmmaker, at the, uh, at the, really in 1911, I think, is when he joins the Keystone, the Keystone Studios. Uh, just to remind you of a story that is told systematically in David Cook's History of Narrative Film, which, you, which is part of our required reading in the course. Uh, and I hope you will uh, attend especially to the details Cook offers about those early years in Hollywood. So, I, 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 so remember, uh, my lectures are a kind of aria, and his book is the baseline. You'll get much more from my lectures uh, if you've done the reading. And the, the, the reading will strengthen and, and solidify and concretize many of the speculative points I make in my lectures. So I hope you'll uh, respect the, the, the uh, relatively modest amount of, of, of uh, secondary reading that we're requiring in the course. It's, a, it's important to complete the full picture. If you read those chapters from Cook about the early uh, years of Hollywood before Chaplin, the movies before Chaplin, you'll recall that one of the most fundamental things that happens before Chaplin even appears is the establishment, essentially, of the industry I was describing last time. Uh, certain, uh, the migration to the West Coast is worth mentioning because movies, of course, begin their career in the United States on the East Coast. Edison's first movie studio was in East Orange, New Jersey. Much of the, uh, the Biograph Company was originally located in, in, uh, on the East Coast. And mo a lot of, the, almost all the original, uh, the earliest films, uh, even the earliest films that were put into production and shown uh, uh, commercially were made, in the, were, were, made, were made on the East Coast. Uh, why did people move to the West Coast? Why did Hollywood become the sort of center of the movie industry? What explains it? It happens very early. So it's a, and it's a, one might think of it as a very important moment in the history of culture, of popular culture, because Hollywood remains, uh, for all the changes that the movie industry has undergone, Hollywood remains a kind of the, the kind of center of what is now a kind of global enterprise of movie making. What helps to explain the move to the West Coast? Nothing fancy. In the back, yes. They could fill me around. Why is that important? Especially in the early days. 
things whenever you don't have to produce them in the summer and then release Yes, you them. don't you are not dependent on the weather. You're not as de not as dependent on the weather. The sun always shines in California. You you uh, if it's overcast you can still you can still film. If it's uh, th there's no there's there's virtually there's no snow. There's virtually no there's virtually no rain. The 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 weather is very the weather is very conducive to the making of film. And especially in this early phase when film stock was what was relatively primitive compared to the complexity of film stock we have T today the film stock film stock is so subtle that it they can you can film in the dark you can film by firelight even amateur uh, 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 folks owning camcorders can film virtually in the dark. They can film by they can film by by, by electric light inside a room uh, in the in uh, uh, or tape. They can they can videotape in that way. Uh, in the in the in the earliest days of film, you needed a tremendous amount of light to expose the film, and it, what, what, what it meant that you were dependent on, on the weather. Uh, so that was one major reason, but it, there's another one that's even more important in some ways, even though that would seem a sufficient reason for explaining why the migration to the West Coast occurred. There's another even more powerful one. It has to do with the idea of patent warfare. Yes, what's, the, what, what's your suggestion? You don't uh, have to give the right answer. Give a Different types of terrain all in close. Oh, that's also true. Yes, the environment of Southern California is particularly conducive to, vi to a variety of, fi of film projects. There are mountains nearby. There's ocean nearby. Uh, there's desert nearby. So, and, and of course, that's also something that makes it a, un a, a uniquely valuable environment. Maybe not a unique environment, but, but a particularly valuable environment for the movie. That's a good answer, and you're right about that. But there's some Something else that has to do with conditions in the East and Thomas Edison. Remember, Edison, you know, uh, 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 you know, in a certain way, wanted to lay claim to virtually every invention in the early part of the 20th century, and he was primed to do so. He was already recognized as a great genius, as 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 the as the premier entrepreneurial inventor of his era, uh, and he immediately, as he had done with, as he had done with other projects of his, began to take out patents to try to control. Uh, the use of movie technology. He wanted to become a, the Edison monopoly. He wanted. He was. He was fantasizing that he would that, that he would control the movie. What whatever the movie industry would become, Edison's company fantasized it was going to take control of that. And in fact, the Edison company hired. Uh, um, Law enforcement officers, and according to some historians, even in some places, hired goons, thugs, to to go and break up the the uh, the, the sets and the 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 the, the, the shooting of uh, rival producers who were, according to Edison, infringing on Edison copyrights. So the other reason, another reason for the move to the West Coast was a lot of entrepreneurial uh, 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 movie makers wanted to get free of the patent police. They wanted to get out from under the scrutiny of Edison and his police. Uh, uh, and, and by running to the West Coast, they were able to do so. And, and in fact, Edison was unsuccessful in controlling the technology, as, as Cook and other historians have made, have made clear to us. So the move to the West Coast is a very important one. And I will return to the cultural, the, so, the historical and ideological or intellectual implications of his uh, of that move to the West Coast in a, in a, in a few lectures, uh, uh, maybe next week if I, if I get the opportunity, uh, because I want to talk a little bit more about what, what it meant for American movies that film was made on the farthest western verge of the society, away from cultural centers, unlike the way in which movies developed in Europe. And I'll talk about that implication a bit later, uh, probably next week when we talk about the, ger the, germ the great German silent film that concludes our segment on silent films. So even so, so, so before uh, uh, so even before Chaplin enters the rudiments, the, or the, the, the more than the rudiments, the basic system of mass production, of studio-based production, uh, of distribute, uh, of manufacture of the films in, in in one place, and then the distribution system that that developed in which theaters essentially rented or purchased. Films from the producers uh, was already was already in place, and of course the two great figures here is is Thomas Ince, the great fig and and Cook writes very well about Ince and his contribution to the movies. Probably the person we can to whom we could attribute the invention of the movie studio, I suppose, and Max Sennett, 
who, who developed the Keystone Studios, out of which so many important uh, early comedies emerged, and the studio to, which, Chapl uh, to which, Ch which Chaplin joined when he came to the United States in 19, uh, 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 to, to become a movie maker at the, uh, after the, uh, in, uh, I think 1911 or, nine, or, or, or 1912. So, so uh, Ince and Max Sennett are important. And uh, one might say one further thing about, about this moment. Uh, uh, as you know, if you've read Cook, Sennett created what came to be called the Keystone Studios. And they were named, Keystone Studios were named, I think, or maybe it was the reverse, I'm not sure, uh, uh, was associated with their prime product in the early days, and they were called the Keystone Cops Comedies. We're going to show you a fragment of those in a, in a moment. They were frenzied action, frenzied physical, frenzied physical action. Uh, so this is the era, this is the moment, the period the, the before, in the, fir the first 10 years of the movie industry in the United States when uh, the basic system is being, is being uh, 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 by trial and error, uh, worked out. And by the time Chaplin comes to join the system uh, after the first decade or so of the 20th century, the system essentially is in place. There are already a number of famous performers, in, both in comedy and in, and in uh, drama. Uh, there, are, there are emerging certain particular studios that's, uh, that, uh, who, who have refined a mass production technique to produce their movies on a, on a, on a, on a regular basis. So an expanding, an expanding market for the movies is being met by a systematic manufacturing process that uh, INS and Senate begin to work out in, 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 uh, sis, in, in systematic and, and uh, uh, long-lasting ways, in ways that in a certain sense continue in residual form, in vestigial form, to dominate the production of movies even today. Uh, when we were talking about the primitiveness and the simplicity of early film, there was one film I had on the stocks we didn't have time to show you last week, and I thought I would show this to you as a way of illustrating again uh, how relatively simple the early films are. Let's do the damn dog, Greg. Are we ready for that? Okay. Uh, what I want to show you is a uh, is a film from 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 this from, uh, from, from, the, from this relatively early stage in the history of film, and just as a way of reinforcing certain points we were making about uh, the idea that the medium has to be discovered in its nature. It's not immediately obvious to people how the medium should be used, and indeed that people think of the new medium through the perspective and frameworks of older systems, right? Remember, it's not merely a theatrical model that, that shapes early movie. It's also newspapers. It's also visual art. A number of D.W. Griffith's early films actually recreate in, in if, you froze fr if you freeze frame some of his images, what you'll see is that they literally imitate almost exactly certain famous 19th century realistic painters who hang in the great, in the great galleries of Europe. So there's a, there's, a, there's a profound influence from visual art as well, including the way in which visual art frames the action in a certain way. This is also a matter we'll come back to uh, later on. Are we ready, Greg? So wh what I hope to show you now, if, if, if Greg can get it up and working is a is a is is, a, is one of these early comedies. I mean, part of it is to sort of contrast it with the sort of thing that's going to be uh, developed, and especially with Chaplin's mature work. Do you remember the title of it, Greg? What's the whole the, damn family. It's called the Whole Damn Family. The Whole Damn Family. Now here it is. See how much how how influential that first sneeze was. Uh, the name of this film is The Whole Damn Family. There's Mr. Dam, there's Mrs. Helen Dam. There's their son, Jimmy Dam. They, the simplicity of these movements are part of what's interesting to us. I mean, this is still an era in which people are just fascinated by the idea that movies capture movies. But what's the joke here? And it, it, the joke is embedded, I suppose, in the title, The Whole Damn Family. There's Miss I.P. Dam. There's Baby Dam. What an actor. See how it's framed as if it's a painting? how stationary the camera is. There's the damn cook. What's the joke here? Finally, we're going to come to the damn dog. <laughs> 
what's going on here? There's a kind, right? There's a kind, it's kind of risque in, 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 remember, we're talking about late Victorian, post-Victorian era. What's the joke here? It's the play on the word damn, right? You, you, it doesn't strike you as shocking, but in fact, you, if you said damn you in 1890 or in 1900 in certain quarters, people step back and say, oh my goodness, there's a kind of semi-vulgarity there. In other words, the fact that, it, 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 it's not an accident that, it, that, that this is not the Thorburn family. Right? Uh, or the Smith family. It's significant that it's the Dam family. Why? Because they want to make a joke. What's wrong with the joke? Why is it a stupid joke for a movie? Because it's not a visual joke, right? What does it depend on? It depends on language, right? In other words, it's almost as if the whole point of this film depends on a joke that depends not on anything that you could experience visually, but that is resident in, 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 in a verbal trick. In, and it's a trivial joke. It's not, much of, it's not much of a joke, but the film depends upon it. And it's, it, it's evidence in a very modest, and, and, but at the same time dramatic and obvious way of how, lo how of, of this process whereby the new medium, this new visual medium, has to emerge out of uh, media, some of which are not visual at all, but are verbal. And, and, and the, 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 it's as if early filmmakers haven't yet learned fully how to exploit the qualities of the medium they're, they're working in. So it's a verbal joke rather than a visual joke. Um, much more powerful and much more successful were the, were the Keystone Cop comedies themselves. And I have, we have one example of that to show you. Uh, I'm not sure that this is a characteristic example, but it's, it, uh, it's close enough to give you a, a, a sort of sense of what the Keystone comedies were like before Chaplin entered the game. Do we have it? The essential joke of the Keystone Cops comedies, there were, I don't know, even know how many there were, perhaps hundreds. There were certainly dozens and dozens. They were immensely popular early short films. Uh, some scholars have, uh, film scholars have speculated that one reason for their popularity was that they made fun of policemen, that there was a, uh, an implicit sort of a, a mild anar mildly anarchic impulse in these early comedies because authority figures, people in uniform, were being shown to be clownish in some way. Uh, the primary element, of course, is to find ways to exploit the movie's capacity to show motion, right? And one reason I want you to see this relatively crude example is that there's a certain sense in which a short film you're going, uh, uh, the, the short film that you saw last week, from Keaton, the film Cops, is a sort of reprise of this tradition of movie making. Although you can see how much more his short, how much more coherent and character oriented Chaplin's, uh, Keaton's short film was. But the way in which especially the cops are mocked and shown to be completely clownish figures. Almost all of the Keystone Cops comedies, to my knowledge, involved incompetent policemen who engaged in mad, active chases which often ended badly for the policemen. Sometimes they would end up all poor, flying into a, a river or an ocean or, a, or, some, other, or some other natural uh, disaster. And I think, you know, you can also see, I mean, part, I mean th there are, you know, cop look at, that, that was actually a very dramatic effect for an early film. Right? Uh, so there's an, awful, there's an awful lot about this that would have interested early, early, seeing that car turn over, some people in the audience might never have seen that in the, in the movies before. <laughs> and you, one could say that these films in a certain way anticipate uh, 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 a, a great deal of the ridiculous action adventure activity that we see in films even today. Uh, uh, but this is typical of those early films where they'll make, where they'll make incredibly implausible jokes just for the sake of making the joke. Uh, and I, I'm not sure. I'm, uh, all right, a Max Senate comedy. This is the kind of comedy then that was being made by the Senate studio uh, before Chaplin arrived. There were also certain figures, uh, uh, 
Fatty Arbuckle, who went to, who worked with the, the fat comedian who worked with Buster Keaton, is an is an example who had already begun to establish comic personae, something like the persona that Chaplin and Keaton created. So they were not the first to do this, and th there was so there was a subtler and more already somewhat more character-oriented comedy beginning to emerge before Chaplin appears. But Chaplin's entry into American movies is also a turning point, a fundamental turning point, as many. Scholars have have recognized, uh, and and uh, it's a turning point primarily because what Chaplin introduces, I mean, introduces many many things to to comedy, but he introduces one thing especially, or at least two things especially. The first thing that he introduces is what we might call the principle of the slowdown. Instead of frenzied motion all the time in Chaplin comedies, there are moments of quiet. And in these moments of quiet, and this is why they're important, what begins to happen is an attention is thrown away from violent, frenzied physical action toward character. What Chaplin introduces into movies is, an intre is, a, is a, a somewhat more systematic and serious, interesting character than had ever occurred before. And what follows from that introduction, from slowing down the action, creating moments of human interaction in which, in which the interest is essentially psychological and individual, Rather than an interest simply in frenzied motion and jokes, and uh, or or frenzied motion and suspense, which is what you would get from a, a Griffith melodrama, what you're getting is uh, uh, th so this introduces several things. First of all, it introduces a tonal variation. It means that in the middle of comedies, there could be quiet, serious moments, and in fact, it becomes the hallmark of Chaplin's comedy that it really is often not funny. <laughs> or at least that it's based on unfunny materials, and that there are poignant and moving moments. It's as, it's as if Chaplin combines comic and melodramatic elements, especially in his, best, in his best work. I don't mean that when he came into the films, he began to do this. In fact, he discovered how to do this in the course of his, uh, in the course of his career, about which I will speak in a moment. So Chaplin brings an a new interest in, in in uh, character and in psychological nuance, and because of that, introduces tonal variation, a, a, a complexity of tone into movies that had never ex that had never existed uh, or had, had not existed uh, uh, effectively before. I can give you some sense very quickly of how Chaplin's. Um, uh, development of his character. Uh, um, Worked, but uh, mainly by t but reminding you that, that we think of the tramp figure as as uh, indelible and uh, uh, unchanging in a certain way. His costume always the same, his face always the same. The kinds of problems he gets into always similar, and that's partly true. But the tramp was not born Im fully fully dressed in Chaplin's brain. Uh, he 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 evolved the champ over a series of, over a series of short films uh, in the in the uh, in the period from 1911 through about uh, 1913 or 14. And one way I can dr dramatize this for you was to show you how Charlie looked in the very first film he appeared in. He was not an actor. He was not a director in this film. He was just an actor, and he was a walk-on actor. He was not the set star. The camera had an immediate affinity for him, and after people saw this film, it was the first film he appeared in, this is still from a film called Kid Auto Races at Venice. It's a kind of documentary about soapbox racing. And Chaplin, the Chaplin character had just been hired by Max Sennett uh, to join this Keystone Studios, and he made an appearance in the film. He really didn't have anything to do, but his appearance in the film caused all kinds of interest uh, in the audience. The audience wanted to know who that character was, why he was so interesting, and uh, uh, what was interesting about him. You can see the, the, the beginnings of the tramp uh, uh, costume there, but not, not, not the complete tramp. Here's another early version of Chaplin with his co wearing a long coat and not looking not looking very nice. Uh, this is um, uh, 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 Charlie is supposed to be drunk in this picture. That's one reason he looks nasty. Uh, and it, he's it's in a film called Mabel's Married Life, and uh, 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 he's he's um, he's actually in conversation with a dummy in this in this uh, sequence. Uh, but you can see here that that the long coat violates our idea of who the tramp was, and so it took a while before the Chaplin persona. Uh, completely emerged, and it was partly a, 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 a matter of trial and error, although very quick trial and uh, trial and error. 
I want to say a word about Chaplin's career to give you a fuller sense of, of how swiftly he became an icon and how significant his example is for our understanding of the power of movies. Um, Chaplin's dates are 1889 to 1977. Uh, he, and his early child, he was born in England, and, he, uh, and his, his early childhood is actually the stuff of Dickensian melodrama. Uh, both terms I choose with some intentionality because uh, there are parallels between uh, 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 Charlie Chaplin's early life and the victimization that, that Dickens dramatizes so powerfully in many of his uh, <laughs> famous novels. And there are parallels between Dickens' own childhood and Chaplin's childhood. Dickens, the great 19th century novelist who, like Chaplin, was interested in victims, lay, laid emphasis on the, on the problems of, of, of uh, vulnerable people, of women, of children, who wrote variations on what we might call the mortgage melodrama all his career. His greatest works could be said to be forms of melodrama. I'm talking about Charles Dickens, the great 19th century English novelist. And Chaplin grew up in an environment that was steeped not only in Dickens, but in the traditions of stage and novelistic melodrama that permeated European culture and especially English culture of this time. Uh, but, his li but his life was a, very, was a very difficult one in some ways as well. Uh, his, his father died when he was eight. Uh, his mother was in and out of institutions uh, mo uh, all of her life. There were periods in Chaplin's life when he was just a little child, when he was literally completely abandoned. And he and his older brother spent time living in doorways in the streets of London. He was literally a homeless urchin as a child. He, he began to act on the stage from the age of seven. Uh, and almost immediately was recognized as having uh, a, a astonishing, astonishing gifts. He worked from 1906 through 1913 for a theatrical company in England called the Carnot Company, K-A-R-N-O. And it was a company that put on uh, 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 a, certain kind of the, uh, 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 a certain kind of theatrical anthology in which there would be skits, comic skits, and serious skits acted out. Sometimes uh, uh, the, uh, uh, when the skits were over, people would come and do song, uh, there would be song and dance numbers, uh, uh, sometimes just st straight singing. It was a, a, kind, a kind of British variety show influenced especially by the traditions of the British Music Hall. And the Carnot Company was a traveling company. First, Chaplin worked with the company all around the British Isles. And then, in I think 1909 or 1910, the Carnot Company made a triumphant tour of the United States. By this time, Chaplin was one of the leading actors in the, in the one of the great uh, 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 features of the Carnot Company performances were pantomime performances, and Chaplin was a particularly brilliant pantomimist. Uh, so, that, and he, so he had a, a very significant career. He was already a, a successful performer on the stage in the Carnot Company and, 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 and uh, uh, drew on traditions of performance. His father had been a, Chaplin's father was a popular singer who actually, his songs were published and he, he sang in the musicals for a, for a certain period. Uh, uh, and Chaplin's mother had visions or fantasies of being a performer herself and used to perform in privately to Charlie. So Charlie, come, Charlie was steeped in performance, steeped in theater. And as a young boy from the age of seven on was already sort of acting on stage, almost continuously after the age of eight or nine, made his living as an, uh, made his living as an actor. So as a relatively young man, uh, he, he uh, uh, made a trip to the United States with the Carnot Company. The Carnot Company uh, toured various cities in the United States, was a great success. A second tour almost immediately followed, I think, you know, within six months. And on that second tour, Max Sennett saw Chaplin perform and, went and hired him away from the Carnot Company. We uh, saw that Chaplin had certain gifts as a performer that would work in the infant medium of the movies and hired him away. And it was an inspired decision. Uh, when Chaplin first joined the Keystone uh, Studios uh, in 19, I think it's 1911, the date is in Cook, uh, so be careful of my, my, my date may be a year or two off. Um, but around 1911, he joins the Carnot Company. His first few films, his first three or four films, he's just a performer in. But he has an immediate affinity for the camera as well. And within half a dozen films, he's already beginning to direct as well as to act. And within a relatively short time, he's in control of every, he's, he, become, he, he gets to be in control of every, every aspect of the making of film, we can, of the making of his films. We can get some sense of how 
uh, richly and symbiotically the audience reacted to the, ch the, the character of the tramp that ch uh, Chaplin created by talking in monetary terms about uh, and uh, 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 monetary terms about the development of his career, about the pro progress of his career. He joined officially joined the Keystone Company. Uh, in 1914, he, uh, he was hired in 1911, 1912, came over to the United States, and, and from 1914 and 1915, he, just that one year, he worked for the Keystone Company and made 35 films uh, in that one year period. He received what was then a princely salary of $150 a week. The, the final films of those 35, the last 15 or 20 or so of them, featured the tram figure who had now been fully elaborated in various adventures that became characteristic of Chaplin's vision of the tramp. And they were unbelievably popular, by far the most popular shorts that had ever been sent out of uh, any movie production company. Uh, and they made Chaplin a household name first in the United States and then fairly quickly all over the world. So, so successful were those early films that in 1915 he was hired away by another company the Assane Company, E-S-S-A-N-A-Y. And for another year, 1915, 1916, he worked just for the Assane Company. But his salary went up from $150 a week to $1,250 a week in one year. And that's a gigantic, a thousand, more than $1,000 a week in, in uh, 1915 is, a, is an unbelievable fortune, of course. Uh, he makes only 14 films in that period, so he goes from making 35 films in a year to making only 14 films, and those 14 films are more highly finished. He spends more time with them. We can see in this period, we can see Chaplin learning, we can see Chaplin enacting in small the, the Fred Ott principle. We can see Chaplin enacting in small the principle I talked about last week, in which we see him learning uh, to, to develop performance styles that are appropriate to the camera, appropriate to the, to the to, 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 to cinematic experience, uh, developing, de, 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 developing uh, techniques as a director to emphasize certain aspects of the Tramp's character, uh, 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 ex experimenting with, with tonal variation in his films, experimenting with, 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 with various kinds of, 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 of comic devices, some of, which, some of which he imports from his performances with the Carnot Company, and some of which he, uh, some of which he, many of which he refines and changes because he's working in the movies. One famous example of this migration from stage to screen is is a bit that Chaplin was especially famous for when he worked for the Carnot Company. He did a bit for them, a pantomime called the Inebriate Swell, the Inebriated, the Drunk. Uh, sir, uh, aristocrat, that's what a swell is, a rich aristocrat, who, uh, a, a man about town. The inebriated, the, drunk, the drunken aristocrat, right? And, when, and, and it was one of the most popular pieces that he, that he performed on stage for the Carnot Company. He remade a version of it, a very famous film. It's one of the very few short ch chaplains where Chaplin doesn't play the tramp where he's dressed up in a tuxedo and he plays the inebriated swell. Uh, and it's a film called 1 AM. And in the entire film, Chaplin plays a, a, a man who is drunk and who keeps encountering objects that he misunderstands, right? So uh, as an example, he comes across a clothes tree in his house, and instead of hanging his clothes on it, he embraces it as if it's his wife, right? Uh, that sort of thing. And uh, it, one of the things, the, 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 almost the entire length of 1 AM has, has only one performer in it, Chaplin himself. Uh, and he kind, of, he kind of recreates and modifies what he had done on stage in that performance. It is in many ways a very brilliant performance and shows how imaginatively Chaplin, the Chaplin character can interact with objects, a, a, a theme to which I'll return tonight when I talk more systematically about modern times and about certain of Chaplin's favorite strategies for establishing character. Um, so he works for the SNA company, makes 14 films, including uh, in 1915 a film called *The Tramp*, fragments of which I'm going to show you in a couple of in a, in, a, in, a, in a few minutes. Uh, then he's so successful again, and the tra and the 14 films he makes starring *The Tramp* become international. Uh, I don't know what to call them, international phenomena, bestsellers. They be, they, uh, the, and the tramp becomes uh, the most sought after and the most memorable character in, 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 in the movies. So he's hired away again by the Mutual Company one year later. And from 1916 to 1917, he works for the Mutual Company, in which he makes, this time, $1 million. 
for that year, and he makes only eight films in that year. So he goes from, uh, from $150 a week to $1,250 a week to a million dollars a year, right, uh, uh, within three years, right? Uh, uh, and and each, each move gives him greater creative freedom, gives him more autonomy. He begins to sort of really refine his art. And we can see the process happening in these, in these shorts. Uh, uh, in, in, in the films you're going to see tonight, two of the films, uh, uh, two of the, both of the short films, Easy Street, 1917, and The Immigrant, also made in 1917, come from this mutual period. And I mention this to you because they're already, in some sense, sophisticated films, even though they're not full feature-length films. And you can see that Chaplin is bringing all the resources of his narrative skills, of his skills of, in creating character, uh, to bear on those films. They're already, in some sense, sophisticated uh, works of narrative. Uh, and and uh, th there, is a, there is an apprentice period that occurs earlier, which I have just described to you. Finally, uh, in his career, he moves uh, in 1918 to a company called First National, which he, for and that, those are the people who pay him a million dollars. I'm sorry, I made a mistake. His mutual salary was a mere $670,000. <laughs> He gets a million when he goes to work for First National in 1918, when he, uh, when he makes, uh, among other films, one of my favorite Chaplin shorts, a film in which we see the tram character playing a GI in the First World War. It's called Shoulder Arms. And it's a characteristic Chaplin short, except that now what Charlie is doing is contending with the Kaiser's army. Uh, he's, fighting the, he's fighting World War I. In earlier films, we'd seen him fighting ice storms. We'd seen him fighting against hunger. We'd seen him fighting in the, literally fighting in the boxing ring in a film called The Champion. We'd seen him working as an assistant to a pawnbroker in a film called The Pawnbroker. A whole series of jobs. And by the time uh, we get to 1918, it's almost as if the tramp has held a whole, uh, virtually every job you could imagine. He, doesn't, he can't hold the job for long because he's a bum. He's a tramp. He's, a, he's, he's footloose. Uh, again, a theme to which I'll return when we talk about modern times this evening. Um, uh, and then finally, in 1919, he moved, Chaplin has become such a gigantic figure, such an international icon, that he joins with certain other icons. D.W. Griffith, the, the greatest, most famous director of the silent era, uh, uh, and two, Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks, the two most famous actors after Chaplin of the silent era, the four of them get together and they form United Artists. Uh, and they formed it in part to create their own company so that they would be able to control their artistic output. And when Chaplin, working for United Artists, beginning in 1919, Chaplin goes to work on his feature films. And he makes the great film, the great silent features that are at the heart of his achievement. He makes The Gold Rush in 1925, a film called The Circus in 1928, a more imperfect and broken back film in some way, but full of his, some of his most imaginative comic performances. One of his great films in 1931 called City Lights. And then finally in 1936, the film you're going to see tonight, already deeply into the sound era, a film that remains in some fundamental way a silent film, Modern Times. Chaplin then goes on when, after the sound era is over to make a series of movies in the, in the sound era. And they all have some modest interest for us because they're Chaplin films. Some, some images from them are, remain very famous to this day. In fact, one of them was in the New York Times today. Does any of you notice it? Not a one of you? Did any, not, you ne don't read the newspapers now that you're... A, now, now that you're trying to become engineers? Well, the, the, the image, uh, the, 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 there was an article about a, a, a scholar of, of globes who uh, had found evidence for the idea that a particular globe in a German museum, which was said to have been Hitler's globe, was not Hitler's globe. Okay, it's a, the guy, uh, but, but in the middle of the story, what they, what, anytime, you, anytime a person of a certain age hears the word globe and Hitler, they think of Charlie's film, The Great Dictator. You're smiling. Why? You know the image that they... Have you seen The Great Dictator? What, what, what is the image they're talking about? 
Yes, there's a moment in the film, it's a, a, a moment of great, it's, it's not really a very good film. I mean, and Chaplin's silent, Chaplin's sound films are mostly of historical interest, despite what some Chaplin buffs would say. His great work is, he's a silent artist, and this, the, the, the sound film caused problems for him that he couldn't fully adjust to. But every one of his sound films has interest and uh, has brilliant moments. And the one you are remembering is one of the most remarkable and uh, astonishing symbolic moments in Chaplin's work. Uh, it's, the, it's an incredibly ambitious film. It tells us how ambitious a, 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 a figure Chaplin was because he makes a satire of Hitler and Mussolini in an era when Hitler and Mussolini are not yet recognized for the egregious, monstrous, evil figures that we know them to have been. They were taken seriously. They, were, they, they had been voted into office. Th millions and millions of people thought they were admirable leaders. So when Chaplin made The Great Dictator in 1940 what, 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 or 41, uh, he was doing something something incredibly daring, and he was actually showing that he thought the movies were, a art form, were an art form capable of taking on the largest political subjects. So even though there are problems in the film, and it's not a, a, an absolutely great film, not memorable artistically in its own way, there are moments in it that are remarkable, and it's also a significant document because it reminds us of Chaplin's ambitions as an artist. Chaplin was one of the very first filmmakers, along with D.W. Griffith, I suppose, to realize that the movies had an aesthetic possibility an aesthetic, uh, aesthetic uh, 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 latent aesthetic energies and, and, and powers that needed to be, that if they were tapped would make the movies the equivalent of traditional art forms like theater and the novel. And of course, he was right about that. And he even made some films that achieved that, that level of seriousness and resonance. The moment that you're remembering, what, what happens in it? Yes, it's a moment of sort of uh, manic glee in which the Hitler character, played by Charlie Chaplin, takes a globe out and it's like a balloon and he pops it up and down and we see him, we see him throwing it up and kicking it with his hand, foot like that. And, and what it, it's a kind of fantasy of world domination. It's supposed to, it's, and it's supposed to show what a ridiculous and infantile figure uh, this mock Hitler is. Uh, and, it, and it is the most memorable image from that film. So in this article that really had nothing to do with Chaplin, there was a picture of Charlie uh, playing Hitler, kicking the balloon up and down. And one reason that I think it's significant is that, it, that it's a, a mark of Chaplin's greatness as an artist, that even in his, even in his imperfect texts, even, even in the films that really do not uh, belong to the, to the category, to, 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 to the most important category of his, of his most lasting and valuable art, they still are part, the images from those works are still part of our common cultural inheritance. He's a very great artist, the first great artist of the movies, and a, and a figure who, whose imaginative uh, 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 creations remain uh, 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 vital and alive today in a way that very few artists from that era remain uh, um, uh, I I similarly uh, accessible and important to people. Uh, and, some, and it's a mark of, of, of the reach of Chaplin's imagination that, that, that this is so, of his importance as a figure. Well, uh, uh, there's, there's much more one could say about the development of his career, but I, I, I want to I cut this short because I want to show you the moment. I, th I mean, I don't mean that there's only a single moment, but I want to show you fragments from the film in which we can see Chaplin really discovering certain aspects of what he wants to do, and also where we can see Chaplin screwing up. We can see Chaplin at a stage before he becomes the, the, the uh, self-confident, totally autonomous uh, uh, artist he, be, he becomes relatively soon. Do, can, we, can we put up fragments from the, champ, from, from the, uh, from the Tramp? Uh, this is a film um, appropriately called The Tramp in which, uh, and it's a fairly characteristic uh, Chaplin film, but I think, it's, I think it's the film in which, among other things, Chaplin discovers that he, can mel that he can marry melodrama and comedy. It's the film in which he discovers that he can do effects that are pathetic and poignant and sentimental and mix them with comedy in ways that are interesting. So here's a scene where Charlie is rescuing a damsel, right? And he does it in a kind of comic way. He's a kind of bum himself, but he's always a kind of chivalric figure. All right, can you jump ahead? I want to, let's just show the next, the, the next one, Greg. Uh, uh, I'm just going to show you a bad moment here. Uh, after, he rescues this girl. She turns out to be the daughter of a farmer. He's then, uh, he's then hired by the farmer, by, by, by the, by the, by the farmer in, in gratitude. And then we get this bit. <laughs> 
And I, I'm showing you this bit partly because I want you to see that it isn't really all that funny or that it's just kind of easy slapstick. I don't mean it's, that it's, with, it's without interest. It obviously has some interest. <laughs> but this incompetence is inconsistent in some respects with uh, the coherent character that he's, that, that, that he's going to begin to create. I don't mean, I, I, I shouldn't, it's never that the tramp becomes this fully competent character, but this kind of joke here, look at this. That's, that's a foolish joke. That makes him, that, that trivializes him in a way. Can you think of examples of that in Keaton? You remember in Cops where, for example, when he's riding along in his, in his cart and he, he, he devises that, uh, that, that mechanism that ends up punching the cop? That would be an example of a kind of, it's a joke, but it sort of violates the spirit of the movie. It's, it, it, it's as if it seems, it seems a piece of debris that is forced into the film that may, may have a comic moment, but makes the film less coherent. That kind of thing is char characteristic of the Tramp. A bit later in the Tramp, I don't have time to show you this, this uh, passage, a bit later in the Tramp, we see Charlie confronting the woman that he had rescued and discovering for the first time, is it a long sequence, Greg? Well, put it up while I'm talking, if you can find it. Uh, you can see, you can see the, in this sequence, which I'll let run behind me while you pay attention to my words, uh, and while the camera s looks at it and then comes back to me, uh, you can, what you can see happening in this, in this sequence is Chaplin discovering how he can be not just comical, but, but sentimental. How he can elicit sympathy from his audience, create sentimental effects. In other words, what Charlie has just done here in this image is he's meeting the girl's boyfriend. He didn't know the girl had a boyfriend. He was falling in love with her. Watch his expression here. So he's very upset by what he's learned. And that, in other words, this is not a funny moment. And, and this is the moment, I think, in Chaplin's career where he realizes the films he's going to make should not be thought of as simply comedies at all, but as something more complicated than that, as comedies with heart, as comedies devoted to character, as comedies that are interested in human interactions. And that discovery tremendously enlarged movie comedy, tremendously enlarged the movies more generally. right? Uh, and then we can see Charlie saying, uh, um, Charlie says goodbye, and he writes this little sad message, and he, and, and he leaves her. So it's the moment when pathos, sentiment, enters Chaplin's work. And in the films you'll see tonight, you'll understand why, after he made this discovery, he began to meld these two elements more and more fully together. So what, this is a way of reinforcing what I called last week the multiplicity principle. <laughs> what we can see is that in those jokes with the pitchfork, there was no multiplicity. They were just funny because Charlie didn't know how to use the pitchfork. Right? But later moments in this film and in many later films, we see Chaplin beginning to create effects which have more than one consequence, more than one significance for the audience. One of the most remarkable things about the chase scenes that Charlie Chaplin develops and begins to perform in his films, and you'll see wonderful examples of them tonight, is that the chase scenes themselves are tremendously moving. They're tremendously comical. Uh, they, uh, they're, full of, uh, they're, they're, they're full of, they're full of comic bits that are just as imaginative as any comic sequence one could ask for, but they do something else in addition to amuse us. They declare for Ch Charlie's character. When Charlie runs away from someone, what we can see him doing is using his intelligence, using his improvisatory um, uh, uh, capacity to figure out how to get away. So that even when he's running, he is also expressing his nature. And when the audience sees the imaginative or clever or daring way in which he makes his escape in a particular chase sequence, they're not just being amused by a joke, they are also understanding his character in a deep way. He's, he, he, he's defining his character even as he's also amusing us. So we can feel the multiplicity of that, the density, the texture of that. Always a mark of superior entertainment. Always a mark, I would say, of art itself. Well, uh, one way to clarify some of this, and especially to clarify Chaplin's uh, 
remarkable popularity is to talk about the tramp as a myth, uh, as a mythic figure. And if you think about his costume, you'll understand what, what, partly what I mean. He wears a coat and vest that are too tight, right, and pants and shoes that are too big. So the principle of mismatch or of ambiguity is built into his costume, right? Uh, and, and then he carries this cane and this hat. Is he, now, he shows a kind of elegance, but it's a kind of shabby, down-market uh, down ele uh, elegance. But the question is, does Char is Charlie downwardly mobile? Is he an aristocrat who's fallen on hard times? Or is he a poor person who has put on airs and, and aspires to the world of, of tuxedos and, fan and fancy clothes? This question is never answered. And that ambiguity in his character may be part of why the audience is able to identify with him. There's, a, there's an uncertainty about where he belongs, about a, 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 a kind of mismatch or an ambiguity inherent in his costume. His body itself is a, is a source of his myth as well. Of his myth, mythological status. It's small, dexterous, energetic, incredibly graceful. He's one of the great acrobats and physical d dancers, physical performers that we've ever that you'll ever see. And in the films you'll see tonight, you'll see many examples of this, including examples of Ch Chaplin on skates, of Chaplin of, of, of Chaplin doing the equivalent of dances, and and of Chaplin uh, of his of his dexterousness in situations involving running or escape as. Uh, 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 just as powerfully uh, as as one as, as anyone we'll see dramatizations of this just as powerful as anyone could ever imagine uh, ever hope for uh, and then his face so his costume his body and then his face are part of the myth as well his an unbelievably expressive face his face is a theater in itself and it was Chaplin more than any other early director who explored the implications of the close up. Uh, and I'll show you some examples tonight of the power of, of the way in which Chaplin manages to uh, use the close-up for in, in, in silent film for incredibly elegant, but uh, to do so, to do so, and to be at the same time what we might call deeply, incredibly eloquent—a uh, a silence that is eloquent because of the uh, qualities in his face. Um, and the moral qualities of the tramp are also appropriately ambiguous. Uh, he has chivalric qualities. He wants to defend children and, and vulnerable women. He's always a kind of uh, defender of the weak. But at the same time, he's an opportunist and also a survivor. And these qualities don't fit perfectly together. And we see both elements in the, in, in, in the tramp character again and again. Again, tonight, in, in the immigrant especially, you'll see both sides of, of, of the Chaplin character, both his opportunity opportunistic side and also his chivalric side. So, so, so he was. A, so, so, so these the, these qualities created a kind of mythic aura, a mythic authority for Chaplin. And there's one other thing that contributed to the myth. It was that it was that there's a historical reality to the hobo figure. Long before Charlie Chaplin began to perform as a kind of tramp tramp figure in the movies, there were real tramps in the society. And, and that, that the, the, the existence of a genuine, popula a genuine population of homeless people who, oh, they often rode the rails, they often, uh, 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 and, and, and they were, pr they, they were, they were, present actors in m most, most small, uh, large and small cities in the country. The, the fact was there was a population of homeless people and th that, that the tramp figure alluded to and reminded the audience of. And that also gave him, helped, to, helped to strengthen his, his mythic power because it was as if the audience was recognizing that there were, uh, uh, that, 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 that in some sense Charlie was a kind of embodiment or a symbol of this, of this social actuality. So he, was, he had a kind of mythic power that communicated itself to his, to, to his audience. And it meant that every repetition of, the, of a tramp film, which might very well go through the same motions, but put the tramp in a slightly different environment or a slightly different job, would be pleasing to the audience, some principle of repetition and variation. Right? Well, finally, the paradox uh, of, of Chaplin's work, and the paradox I want you to think about tonight, and we'll end with this point. Uh, is that Chaplin's world is full of comedy. It's a comic, it's a comedian's world, although it's more than just comic, as I've suggested. But the irony of Chaplin's world is that the comedy is so fundamentally based on things that are so deeply unfunny. Chaplin's the most deeply social and in some ways even political of directors, and I'll discuss this aspect of his work tonight when we talk about modern times and some of his other and some of his other films. But the crucial point here is that Chaplin's world is a world of elemental themes. Virtually every single Chaplin movie is about hunger, aggression, 
victimization, confinement. I mean, the subject matter of Chaplin's comedy is the, la is, the la is the furthest from comedy. And part of his genius, part of what makes him such a remarkable and important artist, is that this uh, immensely unpromising material, this disturbing and uh, in, in many ways frightening material, dramatized sometimes with full frightening effect. Chaplin often, because of his diminutiveness, puts himself up against large figures, giant figures, to emphasize his vulnerability and smallness. Again and again, the, the substance of Chaplin's comedy is the substance of victimization, aggression, misery, uh, uh, inequality, inequity. In other words, the subject matter of Chaplin's work is the furthest from comedy, and yet he makes uh, enduring comedy, enduring melodrama out of those unpromising materials. That paradox is that about Chaplin's world is at the heart of his work, and it's at the heart of why he, why, of all silent directors, his very best films remain interesting today intrinsically, not just because they're wonderfully interesting artifacts, but intrinsically because they remain serious, valuable films. Some of the films you'll see, all of the Chaplin films you're going to see tonight, the two shorts and Modern Times, fit that description, as I hope you will agree. See you this evening.